which are really made and suitable for Android and mobile development. Um, and our goal was to not get rid of all this knowledge and this things which were uh, just right and good for Android and put over a general abstract abstraction layer for persistence, uh, like for example, uh, porting the JPA to Android or uh, using something like ORM Lite or Green DAO, which are good frameworks, but in our opinion, they put too much blue code and a different programming model on it, which feels strange if you're an Android developer and you want to use the structures which were optimized for mobile usage. So our goal was to make it really lightweight so that actually you don't really see it when you use it. It does not get in your way. And um, you should not deal with Android SQLite database code or write um, cumbersome glue code and all the stuff which is necessary. Um, but if you want to do it, you can do it. So it does not take away features or capabilities from you as a developer. Um, it just make, should make things easier. And we uh, we wondered which approach we should use for the uh, framework. Should we um, use a model and then generate uh, persistent classes? Should we use a generic runtime and interpret the code um, during runtime? Um, but all those, those approaches had drawbacks for us. So we decided to use uh, annotations and the annotation processor and do most of the work during compile time. So we use standard Java annotations and create Java source code uh, during the compiled process. You can find it on GitHub. It's under Arconsys data robot. And the main features are it's annotation based. You don't need any hard-coded strings in your code. So uh, it's very robust to refactorings and changing codes and adaptations and code which involves and grows over time. And it gives you code generation for repeating tasks and the glue code. So you don't have to type all the stupid code um, <laughs> all the time. And one nice thing uh, I think is it gives you compile time protection uh, when you're renaming fields or tables. Mm -hmm. This is especially great if you're developing uh, a test-driven approach and really you, you change the structure of your code and it comes to life and you find out something, you learn something new about the product and the features and then you change change it, but you don't have to yeah, uh, fix all the bugs afterwards. The compiler already helps you to, uh, to don't not make too many introduced too many bugs already. And it's always possible to use the default Android API. So uh, the default API is not shielded from you. You have full access to everything in Android uh, yet without using data robot. It's just a thin layer on top, uh, which gives you some convenience. But if you want to do something very special, hardcore optimization programming, uh, you can still do it. And it does not interfere. It's really simple to set up. Um, 
um, on our in GitHub in the wiki we describe the different setups for Eclipse, IntelliJ, Maven Gradle, and also uh, Android Studio with Gradle. It's basically basically two or three steps, and then it should be up and running. For can you read the screen? Yeah. Okay. Um, just giving you an example for for the Android Studio Gradle integration, which is probably the most common integration if you're developing for the Android platform at the moment is uh, you just need to add two dependencies to your uh, class path in your uh, build Gradle file. The first one is you have to integrate the Android Gradle build tools. You have to do this either way. And you need to add these, this uh, dependency for the annotation processor to make it work in Gradle. It's a plugin that helps to run the annotation process like that. And in your app build to Gradle file, you make sure that you include the plugins and uh, add those parameters to your dependencies so that for the app, the APT the annotation processor is run. And this is the, the package. From, from Maven, we uploaded it, we made a release on Maven Central for it, so you can directly use it. And um, here's a small layer with the API and runtime, uh, compile time dependencies for the framework and some base classes and utility classes on, on top, which, which I use. So that's basically everything you need to, to set it up. Um, I said before that we use annotations and based on those annotations we generate code and this code, the generated code can be found under this path and here it's uh, the same rules apply to what I said previously to change your objective C's. This code is not there to be changed manually. It's, um, it's nice to have it available so for debugging you can set breakpoints you can see what's going on under the hood and find out that there's really no magic going on. It's code you would write as an Android developer manually. So I think this uh, is really important to uh, make sure that all the time, if you use third party frameworks, that you understand what's going on in those third party frameworks, especially if it's uh, an important product and you have to maintain it and debug it Someday. So, what are the first steps? Uh, creating a database uh, is pretty simple. We, we need some some starting point to bootstrap the annotation processor and the code generation. This basically is really simple. You just add a class. Uh, I call it persistence config, but it can be any class you have. It can be the application class you have in in Android or an activity, it doesn't matter. It just has to be in the compile path. And it needs the annotation at persistence. There you can add a DB name. The default is, I think, uh, db.db .db or something like this. And uh, you can add the DB version. And additionally, you can add an annotations update and create and implement those marker interfaces, uh, those interfaces, so that you get notified if your database uh, is created initially, or if your database uh, scheme should be changed when the version ch changes, if you want to do migrations of the database schema, or uh, if you want additional, add additional indexes, or some uh, functions, uh, stop procedures, or something in the database, which is not very common in Android, but maybe some people want to use this stuff. So I think that's pretty simple to get it straightforward to bootstrap the process. And the next thing is um, what are the data structures, what are the entities? And this, I think those who are familiar with JPA will recognize this. It's very similar. You annotate your um, your data model with an entity and you 
should annotate um, integer long and in the next version also strings are supported with uh, to be the primary key uh, if it's a number uh, it can auto increment and you tell RoboVM this should be a column the name should be a column and you need to add a default constructor to it that's basically it and you can add some additional attributes and parameters. For example, if you want the content, you can create a content provider out of this class. If you want to share your data with another application, you can, uh, do you know what, what a content provider is? Are you familiar with Android development? Mm -hmm. You can uh, use it as an interface to other apps and other processes to access the data and uh, you can add here parameters to create also a content provider to make it exported and also the authority is basically the ID of the name under which the content provider will be accessible for other application. You can simply specify it and a content provider will be created for you. Um, I think before I go into the Next slides, I will show some examples. I think that's, that's an example. Okay, big enough? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, the first thing, thing I did here is just create in Android Studio a, a plain Java. Uh, not Java, uh, Android project, it's a Hello World, the standard uh, template in Android Studio, mm -hmm. and I made two small changes, here integrating the uh, uh, annotation processor, and in the app, build gra Gradle, um, adding the processor dependency and the API dependency. So it's what I uh, showed you on, on the other, other slides. And the code is just a plain application. So that's the first step. If I run it, it just opens the simulator and says, hello world. So I won't do this because the simulator is slow. Um, So the next thing is I created uh, this persistence config here, okay, this class, and annotated it to uh, the DB, DB name should be a San Diego Java user group, DB version one, uh, call this uh, log message when the table is created, and if the schema is changed, the version changes, call this update method, and I added an entity here and just an annotated it. So I think this, you, you know this from using JPA and other mm -hmm. platforms, it's really lightweight and very common to, to use it. And for a Java developer, I think it feels pretty natural and everybody will immediately understand what's going on here. So if I run the code, Okay. Um, 
now we have those files annotated. We want to make use of them. I hope the demo gods are with me today. <laughs> simple, we create a new, new event here, and we use a class uh, called Entity Service, which uh, can manage the events for us, and we simply call Save Event, and now it's saved in the database. It's really, really simple, and it uses a transaction to its transaction which we call, call Save. Curious, what do all people use um, to, to, to build like SQLite databases? I, I used to do it like manually. I'm actually using it in a commercial application. The data robot didn't help a lot, so it kind of cuts down a lot of, a lot of code. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, do you use any ORM frameworks for Android? <laughs> Blaine? Yeah, I used to, I got a, a library on GitHub. something I remember, but it, 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 it's something very simple to this. So, um, I just um, let one pick. The next thing I did here is uh, add, add a couple of other events here, and um, I can also use the entity service to get a list of all the all the entities I just uh, saved. <coughs> Takes, takes a little on my machine. Out some like, host messages after saving, you know, and saved. So many events, and it was pretty, pretty easy, easy to do. So no SQL code, no database code. But here, but, um, just just work like this. Um, so storing an entity. Simple. You get the entity service and just call save. Uh, if you have an object retrieved from the database uh, that has already set a primary key, or you can set it on your own, and if you save this object, it will not create a new object, but it will update the existing object. Okay. Loading an entity, or in this case, loading all entities, uh, you just call get. Uh, we will change the name. To get all entities or something like this, it uh, was forgotten during the factory. Find a better name. But you can also uh, query entities, and this is where the, the, I think the, the power comes in with this framework. It does not interfere with existing Android mechanisms. You can simply use uh, the content resolver, the standard Android mechanisms, to use it. But um, Typically, you need to know all the column names and map those column names, the table name, and everything. And so you have some constant file with the strings somewhere, and um, this is all generated for you. So you have compile time checking, and if you change names, something it you immediately will will see it. And here, for example, uh, we use a base content provider that is also generated. For you, and you, you can simply um, formulate uh, a query here uh, from 
this table from the event table, um, select everything, and uh, where well, the event name is event one. And as an Android developer, this is what you do. Uh, it's nothing new. Android developer. Let's see this in code. Actually, I'm just, just wondering, usually the generated folder shows up here in uh, IntelliJ, so I can see the, the source code, but now it's not synchronizing, that's an IntelliJ problem here right now. But if I uh, right click it, I can jump to the source code. And this code here was generated when I annotated the, uh, the event class. And you can see it uses all, <coughs> all the information we have already during um, development time, um, the, the types, the attribute names, it creates the create statement, it creates some indexes to accelerate queries on the uh, primary keys or in future releases, it will be possible to annotate columns and say, okay, create an index on this column. Also, if you know that you will do um, more queries and what have fast search results. and then you don't need to type this. Typically, you would have to type all this code by yourself. But now, now it's it's generated. And if I want to query the data now, I can use the content resolver, put in the query, and um, just let it run. I let it run a couple of times so I have more entries with the name event one. So, so that's how queuing works. And another very nice feature is um, or what really bothers me using the Android API is um, that you have this big gap between this rela relational and database-like way of seeing things. And with the content provider, content resolver, um, this content values array, they think of flat or relational structures. But in your Java program, you want to have more object-oriented uh, structures and an object-oriented way of, of programming. And typically, uh, you would need a place where you do this uh, object-relational mapping. And as we have all the type information uh, during compile time already, we uh, create a utility class for you. Uh, the cursor utils, uh, you can tell the cursor just to get me the, an object cursor out of it. So instead of traversing a row, you uh, can iterate over uh, an object uh, result set. And 
do typical things like move to last, move to previous, and you can tell uh, the cursor, the object cursor, get current, and you get out the object of it. So you can use it, uh, the object getters and setters to, for example, fill in uh, some some new element. So you don't have to do the mapping for the content values by yourself. Oh, but then you have to cast it to the appropriate Java object, correct? No, it doesn't come here. It's you just say get current, mismap, and it knows that it's an event because you Actually, use generics. Okay. Yeah. And yeah, it's. <coughs> I, I think the code looks much cleaner if you use this, and if you keep this relational stuff more in in other layers, the tiers in your app, and don't mix them up too much. For example, with your UI code. So uh, I always get shiver when I see SQL statements in, in <laughs> UI classes. And this sometimes in, in Android, you see examples also from Google where they do this. Yeah, the, the typical uh, example um, <laughs> is um, the, the list, list view adapters where they use the cursors. It's in the API you get a cursor to fill in the data in a view element. And I think this is an ugly API. Mm. Um, but you can make it a little bit nicer that instead of then uh, accessing it with the array indexes and column indexes based on the database mm. structure, just saying, okay, get, get me the object, and then take the values from the object and fill in the values. That's much less error prone than uh, remembering the indexes, oh, column number seven is the name, column number eight is mm -hmm. the zip code. Uh, I don't think uh, Google did a good job here in the API design. Yeah, but you can also, instead of getting individual objects, if you have a result set, yeah, the cursor with the result data, you can simply say uh, get all, and then you get a list, a collection of the type of all objects. But of course, you have to be careful here. Um, if it's a huge result set, you don't want to map everything and transfer it um, into the object. But so you better know what, how many um, columns you have before you call this. But it's very convenient. I mean, there are many applications where you know I will never have more than 100, 200, or maybe 1,000. Uh, columns, so then it's fine. But if you have 100,000 columns, uh, maybe you should think of paging or something like this to do it for uh, using some constraints to query the data. Um, it's also possible to to use uh, re relations with data robot, and it's pretty simple. You just annotate uh, a member with a relationship, and then all the magic in the database is automatically done for you. It works with one-to-one -one relations. It's really uh, simple. For example, um, create an event, create a place. Place is also an uh, entity. I annotated it in a similar way like, like trace. <coughs> and you can uh, then the event, set place, at this, this other object, this is the one-to-one -one relation, and in the entity service, we query, uh, we save the event, now with the relation, and if we, we get it back, we can call resolve associations, and here we can specify how deep in the object graph we want to resolve um, the, the associations, because the problem is if you have a huge object graph, and if you resolve everything, uh, you might have the whole database in your hand with just one call. And using this level information, uh, you can control it. What do you use to there is uh, one for uh, Just, I just put it away. One, I one, would, uh, one, one yeah. would do the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. It was just to uh, make it red so I don't forget okay. in this talk that I want to explain this. <laughs> and you could only use an example. If you don't put it in, okay. it, it, it will go to yeah. the same yeah. point. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I like leave, leave it out, then it's the okay. false. And 
Yeah, and then in an uh, object-oriented way, I can uh, traverse my object graph, yeah. right? E get place, get place names. So I don't uh, have to maintain all the foreign keys mm -hmm. and the relations in the table. I don't have to think about the relational schema. I just think about my objects and how they re relate to each other, and all the database code gets generated for me. I will sh show it in a second uh, through the slides. And the nice thing is, it works also with end uh, end relations. Mm. So if I have uh, a collection type, return type, or a property, if I have this uh, annotation, it will generate a mapping table for me in the database and maintaining all those references. Um, one special thing is, uh, typically, if you have a one-to-end relationship in a database, you might just add the foreign key into the yeah. end relation part. We decided that uh, one-to-end is a special case of end-to-end, -end, and we always generate the mapping table. Nice. This makes it also easier if you later change your schema, your design, your model, and so, oh, it's not a one-to-end, it's end-to-end. It's end -to -end. Uh, so it's, it's always end-to-end, and yes. in all these special cases, one-to-end, you're using yes. still that intermediate yes. table. Um, we, we feel that this might have an, an big impact on the performance, mm -hmm. but we did some, some measurements, and in uh, typical scenarios, it really didn't, didn't matter. Okay. It was just with milliseconds. I mean, on a mobile device, you don't make queries like on an uh, Oracle database yeah. with uh, business intelligence and data analytics stuff. It's just uh, get the, the feed, and what are my friends doing, what did they have for lunch. <laughs> so how do I use it? Um, the event has an end-to-end -end relationship to participants, uh, one-to-end, special case here. Mm -hmm. uh, so we just create some participants and add them to the event, uh, save it, resolve associations, and can get. So in your class creation of event, I assume you have a collection like list having participation, like uh, like generics, like list, the generic yeah. the participate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In the event, I have this this member, an annotated okay. relationship, and then I can and I, I added a getter method for it. Um, then I get the collection. You can ask its size. It's the standard collection of you know, object oriented place. So, <laughs> um, I have another bigger example, but I think if you're interested in it, uh, I can show you afterwards or if you have questions. Uh, but I show you the examples from here now in real life how it feels and looks. Step. Um, in this example, showing you the features of the object cursor. Um, I added a convert function to my event, simply calling the cursor Eugene, um, get object cursor, and get current. So when I have a cursor, I get can simply convert it to an uh, object representation with one call, and if I have a cursor, I can also convert it quickly to the list. And if I use it, these examples here, I have the cursor from my previous query, convert it and get the event, or uh, get a list of events. Any questions so far? It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? How big is the file, the library? 
just a couple uh, kilobytes. It's, it's very, very small. And it does not have any dependencies to other third party frameworks. This is, we really try to make sure that it's self contained and uh, also we're not dependent on other uh, frameworks. Actually, there are two parts to that. One is the um, processor that we described before. That's not really included in the runtime later on. Right? Yeah. So, the three processor does a lot of the work up front, and the code that gets generated is really the code that you would have written. Cool. Cool. Events. So it's events, query to our events, and get the object from the object cursor and get the list of objects from the query of the size. This was the, let's get to the more interesting stuff, I think, it's this uh, associations stuff. Um, I just wonder what it is. By yeah, this example, I create the event, get the entity service, create the place, set the place, save it, uh, resolve the associations, so I can traverse it in an object-oriented way, and uh, output that information. It's just what we we saw in, in the slides, and just showing you that it was not just a marketing script. <laughs> and um, we are actually with place, so it receives the place and object. It's what you would have expected mm -hmm. from it. And to make the examples complete, doing the same with the NKM. Relations. Um, Changed the path in the last minute that I shouldn't have done. So it uh, generates the code somewhere here. <laughs> <laughs> and it's in the class path, but I don't quickly find it anyway. Um, run 
make sample code now with the uh, NTM association. Okay, there's no like wait a bit. Someone else using Motion? No, but I was going to ask about that one. I'm using the free version. This is free version. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I used it here for the first time. That's the response. Yeah. Typically, That's I use. Time. I yeah. always uh, use the uh, physical device. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I use too usually. Our emulator is so slow, but. I know Jamie Motion, I heard about that one. There are it was Google, quite fast. There are Google accelerated uh, emulators using the Haxon driver already for any version. Yeah. And all of them also include the Google APIs pre installed as well. So I don't see any reason to not use them. That's true, but uh, usually if you're using device, they're straight for the server. Right? Well, the comparison was between Jamie Motion and the standard. The Google was lacking up to uh -huh. five, three or four months ago. But it's catching up, and I actually prefer it instead of Jenny Motion. Really? Mm -hmm. I think it works better. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, typically when we develop apps, we always use physical devices. Yeah, that's the, always. Also for, for iOS development, for, uh, uh, we use the simulators only for uh, demos and uh, showcase things. They are really not reliable. Very often they don't behave in any way like a real device. It's, uh, yeah, from a performance perspective, uh, you can't really tell if things are. Um, tuned and responsive mm -hmm. because you don't know if is this the slow simulator or mm -hmm. is my CPU doing something, checking mails in the background or syncing my Dropbox account? By the virtual box or KDM as well. Yeah, but the virtualization device. environment that this is using. Yeah, so basically it, it, it works, but um, if you put on a real device, it behaves totally different than here. For example, if I click buttons or if you do swipes, etc. You don't really get a feeling for how the app will behave later in the real world. At work I'm using macOS, at home I'm using Linux, mm -hmm. and it might be macOS actually. We are having a lot of problems with any emulator on macOS at work. Yeah? Yes. I have no problems on Linux. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I mean, uh, it works. You can see that it works functionally, everything is there, but um, a lot of times for mobile applications, a very important thing is uh, this uh, usability aspects. Correct. If we help, are the transitions fast enough? Uh, is everything smooth? Mm -hmm. Is there some stuttering that when I s scroll something? Um, how do the, c the colors c come out? And everything, and also on the original size of a mobile device, because here it's huge, and it, the impression is totally different if you use a real device or a simulator. And for this reason, we decided to uh, buy all devices in the world. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, to make our developers happy, so everybody has the stack of uh, latest devices and is changing them during the day three or four times and trying different devices. So Take a look at the Appium Grid. You can install an Appium Grid and connect all the devices to that one mm -hmm. with the server that uh, pushes all the applications. So you will need something like 10 devices and anybody can use them. Oh, you, you can use them. Mm -hmm. Appium Grid, yeah, Appium check grid. it out. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, great, thanks. I tried, spell? definitely. How do you spell it? A-P-P-I-U-M, Appium Grid. Okay. So uh, I'll spare you the next demo. Uh, mm -hmm. It's basically the same things. But uh, I prepared um, an app which is a little bit more sophisticated by hand in standard Android way, creating all this uh, database mapping files and all this stuff, and then applying step by step um, data robot to it, generating the content provider, the entities, and removing all necessary code. And uh, it's reduced by probably 60 to 70% of the code is just gone. And it's much easier to maintain and all this glue code which does not reflect any business logic or what capability what your app should do is done. Um, but still you have all the features from Android if you like to use a content provider or if 
if you want to make special queries with the content resolver loaders, um, uh, view adapters, all this stuff, it, it simply works, it integrates really very well into an existing, in the existing Android framework. Short roadmap, we will introduce named relations uh, in the next release, <coughs> hopefully, because what I didn't show you is one of the problems with the end to end relations. If I have two relations to the same object, for example, uh, I have an entity person with a home address and a work address, then um, both types are ad address, and the framework does not know which relation to choose, so we have to name them to make sure uh, we can that generate the schema properly. So now we would have just the same mapping table for work and home address, which is not like expected. Um, then we will also add um, bidirectional association, meaning if you add uh, an associated object into a collection, for example, it directly gets the reference back set. So we can uh, navigate through the object graph in all directions, mm -hmm. up and down, which is very convenient to, uh, for the business logic. You don't have to think in these foreign keys uh, in this relational manner. You simply traverse your object graph. Um, a Fluent Query API, uh, also some constraints for the column uh, annotation. So some uh, constraints are generated on the database, but now you, you need constraints, some indexes. Uh, another request was to also broadcast intents on certain steps. For example, if data has changed in the database, also make it possible that a broadcast is sent to notify uh, other components of the changes. And uh, also projection support which goes hand in hand with the query API. Um, very often, you don't want to query the whole object from, from the database. You just want, want to have one value or get, have some aggregations, uh, a sum, an average of, of a value. And with the projection support, you can just say, I am only interested in, for example, the ID or the name of these objects. So not all the, uh, the projection leaves out all the other stuff, so it's it's a slight performance improvement. Yeah, it's on on GitHub. You can uh, try it out. We are very happy if you provide us with feedback. It's in, in an early stage, the project, uh, but I know of five production apps, also with, um, yeah, customer basis. We use it for um, one of our apps where we have roughly 300,000 users and um, a lot of data. It's a cloud synchronization app and uh, we have huge data amounts, a lot of pictures and something like Dropbox. And it, it works really well and we compared it to other uh, ORM uh, tools available today. And from the performance, memory footprint, um, we were faster and smaller than the others, but we must admit we don't do all the stuff which the other frameworks do, but that's intentional. We do not want to add then UI binding support and networking support and all this fancy stuff. It's data robot just for your assistance and it should make your life as a developer in this case easier and you, it should not get in the way as a developer. Thank you very much. I think we've gone on slightly over time, but that's not a problem. So only one question as we shake up the coupons here. Does anybody have a question? Okay. If you, if you update the database, will it move it backwards and travel? Will it read the changes and update your what we have is we have this update and create annotation. So it's basically the same mechanism we have today. And you get this callback <laughs> that the data has based scheme has changed, and then you have to apply the changes you have to create the simple statements and apply them. It's manually here. Yeah. Because we um, we thought it's too complex to figure out all the model changes between the versions. And we thought it's too error prone. And if you 
have to faint in this detail about it, you might as well write down the, uh, the order table statements. Okay. okay, so this is it, last call.